before Oliver and I met, I never really believed in fate, in one true love, although the concept had always interested me. People are happy with, with people, though, aren't they? And after all, how do you ever really know? You know? But before Oliver, I had been floating weightlessly in space. And then I was home. Oliver was my gravity. The first time I met him, I felt attracted to him, which was a surprise because I had never really questioned my sexuality before. But then again, I had only ever been with Anne Marie. We had one of those naively charming relationships. We'd grown up together, the best of friends. It was perfectly predictable, but I adored her. She, she loved me. Cassandra and her other half are coming over tomorrow evening. She reminded me one Thursday. I had seen them before, Cassandra and Oliver, but we had never spoken. I really wanted to see Oliver again. I wondered if he'd remember me. We'd made eye contact a few times before, but on those occasions, I felt like I was falling in love with him. It was just so unusual. I wanted to see if I'd feel that way again if we actually met. He was beautiful. Did I love him? Surely not. But I did. I poured us both a gin and tonic, and we sat and chatted in the living room. I felt as though I had known him for years. It turned out that we'd almost met before, and not just the once. Our analogous paths had been so close to converging. My pinot-drenched summer in a Charente Maritime vineyard, drinking on the harbor side, where he had spent six months painting boats. I must have seen him then, but then again, I would have known because had I had seen him, then I had never stopped looking for him. We got to talking about university. Crystal, he repeated after me, he shook his head as if reacting politely to a not very funny joke. Then he told me about how he had been all set to go to Bristol. He even met the landlord of his student digs, left a box of books in his bedroom to be, but and then his mom took ill, and Oliver wanted to stay close to her. So he relinquished his place at Bristol after sweet-talking Sussex admissions. He picked his books up a few days later, but found that one was missing, Plato's Symposium. I took a deep breath and walked over to the shelf. Running my hands across the book's spines, I settled on a thin paperback and released it from its place. I passed it to Oliver, and he wordlessly ran his hand over the cover and opened it, beginning to read. I'd underlined part of Aristophanes' speech that had really struck a chord with me that day, when I had gone into my neighboring room, the room that was just like mine, but unoccupied, and picked up a book from the box on the floor. Love is born into every human being. It calls back the halves of our original nature together. It tries to make one out of two and heal the wound of human nature. About a week later, I went back in to replace the book, thinking that its owner may be back to retrieve it. But the box was gone, and although the room was empty, it felt more my own than the one that I had, so I moved my things in. I always wondered why I felt so drawn to that room, so indistinguishable from its neighbor. My room, and mirror image. <laughs> Turned out that Cassandra and Oliver had a similar story to Anne Marie and me. Schoolmates that let their friendship roll into bed and on into commitment. He was beautiful, and I couldn't stop thinking about him. In that one evening, I committed every contour of his face to memory, every pore, every slight expression, the tone of his voice. I could even hear him if I really stopped and listened. I dwelt on our past and present and convinced myself that we were meant to have met earlier. I had never experienced anything like it, 
the total one-track mindedness of it all. Oliver was the last thing that I would think of at night and my first thought in the morning. He filled my dreams so completely that I worried he would spill out into the realm of the wakeful, that I'd utter his name or find myself sleepwalking toward him. What would Anne Marie think? It would devastate her. But I was so acutely overwhelmed by my need to see him. We met in a quiet bar one evening. I saw the relief in his face when he saw me tucked into the corner table. We confessed our contemplations immediately. I understood the depth of feeling in his eyes. When his hand brushed mine, I felt years of passion course through me as he brought me to life. We held hands under the table, looking into each other's eyes lovingly and guiltily. It was love, pure and particular, and it was ours. We decided not to tell anybody after all. What, what could we say? All we knew is that we had found each other, completed one another. With him, everything was as it should be. We were married the following summer, Oliver and I. I tortured myself through a honeymoon full of lament and regret as I pondered what could, what should have been. I knew I had made the wrong decision. I had found my other half, a half that had fit into me. Where was it now? I knew that Oliver felt exactly the same. I knew what he wanted, too. He never stopped thinking about it, talking about it. The circumstances that had tried to throw us together over and over like a rough sea against smooth rocks. Somewhere in France, the room in Bristol, the book. The weddings were the final coincidence, this time driving us apart. The 20th of August, the day that Oliver and I were married, and to Cassandra and me, to Henry.